Hello and uh, good morning to uh, each and every one of us and uh, thank you once again for joining us in God's uh, Cathedral of Time as we come each uh, uh, Sabbath we come to uh, lift up the name of Jesus and to those of you that do not or for whatever reason as I say each week either recognize or understand that for whatever reason you maybe you've been told that you should not keep God's Sabbath day I'd like to share a Sabbath nugget with us each week and this week I'm going to make it very plain and, and, and simple to us because I think what I'll share in our Sabbath nugget has everything to do with what the, the message will be uh, uh, in, a, in a little while. In the book of Exodus, Exodus the, chap the 20th chapter, and uh, we find in the Ten Commandments law, the people of Israel had just been delivered out of Egyptian bondage, and God uh, had given them his Ten Commandments on the tables of stone. And um, there are many that say that the commandments never existed uh, before Sinai, but that is not true. As long as God has existed, his laws have uh, existed. They have been 400 plus years in captivity and obviously they have lost touch. And uh, that commitment had waned to God and so God in his love and mercy basically just reiterated to them and wrote it on tables of stone. I'm not going to read the entire Ten Commandments. I pray that you all would go back and read it for yourself. But it begins in the book of Exodus uh, chapter 2. And this is what it says. I'm the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Egypt is representative of sin, my dear brothers and sisters. And so when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord of Savior, he brings us out of that house of bondage and out of sin, and he gives us his commandments. But particularly today, I would want to read uh, Exodus 20, beginning from verse 8 to 11, which is the Sabbath commandment. And this is what the Bible says. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. You see, there were others, there were Egyptians that came out of bondage that followed God's people. And God is saying that his commandments or for them too, it is for us, verily. And it continues. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the Sabbath day. Therefore God blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So the day that God had blessed and sanctified, it's his holy Sabbath day today, not any other day of the week. Oh yes, we have God's blessings throughout the week. But there is something special about his holy and blessed Sabbath day, and he has encoded it in his Ten Commandments. May the Lord have mercy on all of us, because when we refuse to keep God's, ten, God's Sabbath day, we are actually living in rebellion. Yes, that's what the Bible says. God says to do this, but we are working to establish another form of righteousness that keep another day than God has made holy. And that's really, that's really the, the sum of the matter. I pray that someone today that is listening that have not quite understood what God's Sabbath was all about would come to accept it, what he says, and by his grace, follow him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your great love and your grace and your mercy towards us. Here we are, dear Father, coming in humble obedience to you as we come as your, on your blessed and holy Sabbath day, dear Father, and we trust you and we believe in you, dear Father, and have the faith in you that what you have promised that you will do, and that is to bless us as we come together in your house on your holy and blessed Sabbath day. And bless all of those that are listening, dear Father, particularly those, particularly the ones who may not have 
accepted you as their Lord and Savior. Again, dear Lord, those that have not accepted your, your, your Sabbath commandment, dear Father, pour out a special blessing upon them today and upon all of us, upon all of us, dear Father, may your rich blessing attend us, that as a result of gathering here today, that we all, dear Father, would have a taste, would have a taste of your love, of your mercy, of your grace, and that we would come out of this place, dear Father, a better person than we came in. In Jesus' name I pray, be with your man servant, sanctify my thoughts, and give me the words to speak, that your people would be blessed. In Jesus' name I pray, and for his sake, amen, amen. and amen. 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 Today we, by God's grace, want to share with you on the matter of the power of the Word of God. The power of the Word of God. You know, so often we read our Bibles, uh, some of us more than others, but we read our Bibles and to a, a great extent, we don't realize what, what are we actually doing when we read the Bible. And today I want to talk with us about the power of the Word of God. And when I'm talking about the power of the Word of God, I'm not talking about the ink on the paper. And yes, that is a means by which the Word of God comes to us. I just shared with us about the Sabbath commandment. It was written on tables of stone, the Word of God. Uh, but the Apostle Paul tells us that we should be epistles that would be read of men. In other words, the Word of God needs to be in our hearts, in our lives, that men and women would know that we have been with Jesus. And as we talk about the power of the Word of God, let's go in the beginning. The Bible opens up in this way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. We're talking about the power of God, of God's Word. And so just by speaking, in this atmosphere of nothingness, God spoke, and he said, let there be light. I want you to notice that Moses did not engage in any theological exegesis, as it were. He didn't bring forth any philosophical, if you will, presuppositions. He just barely said, that God, in the beginning, God created, and God said, let there be light. And brothers and sisters, I want you to know this morning that that very first three verses that I just read in the Bible demands our faith. Paul would tell us that the just shall live by faith. Oh, how many of us were there when God created. How many of us were there when he said, and let there be light. The power of God's word brings into existence the world itself. As we go through the Genesis story, uh, in the book of Genesis chapter 1, you would see where God spoke. And the heavens and the earth came into existence, the, the fish of the sea, the animals of the earth, the moon, the stars, and the heavenly bodies came into existence as a result of God's word, God said. My dear brothers and sisters, we must understand that God is so merciful and because he wants us to understand who he is and the power of his word, the Apostle John now, thousands of years after the, creator, the creation story, 
was said to us in the beginning, in the beginning, John using the very words that Moses used, in the beginning was the word, the word of God, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made of the word of God. But I want to praise God this morning that he didn't leave us in ignorance. He demonstrated to us not only what it is word, but who is his word. Because as we continue to read the book of John, in John chapter 14, the Bible declares, and the word. That same word that created the universe, that created the heavens and the earth, that same word that brought light into existence when there was darkness, that same word that created the fish out of the sea and the animals on the land, the Bible says, and the word became flesh and dwell among us and we beheld his glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And who is that? Who is that? It's none other than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're talking about the power of God's word this morning. And I pray that you would put on your thinking caps. And as we talk about the power of God's word at the end of this discussion, that someone, someone would come yeah, if for the first time to realize the power of the word of God and to make a decision to obey, obey the word of God. You know, there are some that say that it took God millions of years to create the heavens and the earth. But I want to praise God this morning that he took care of that heresy because each day that he created he says the morning and the evening were the first day the morning and the evening was the second day the morning and the evening was the third day oh yes and when he get to the seventh day the bible says that he rested and blessed and sanctified the seventh day that's why we come here each sabbath because it's blessed and it's sanctified it's a 24-hour period, the evening and the morning, from sunset to sunset. The day shall be, we're told in the book of, of uh, Leviticus chapter 23. My dear brothers and sisters, God doesn't need a million years or a thousand years to create anything. He does it just by his word. The psalmist David understood that clearly, and so David wrote in the book of Psalms, the 33rd chapter, beginning in verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. The Bible tells us that God formed man from the dust of the earth, and breathed into him the breath of life and man became a living soul by the breath of his mouth those things were created by the breath of his mouth by his word that you and i live and we have our being and david continues he gathered the waters of the sea together as a heap he laid up the death of them in the storehouses let the earth fear the lord let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him for he spake, for he spake and it was done, he commanded and it stood still. I know that today that many have become so educated and so wise, so wiser than God that they have a better idea as to how we came into existence. You must have heard of the Big Bang Theory. I believe in the Big Bang Theory because what a bang it must have been when God says, let there be light, the other foolishness I don't. My dear brothers and sisters, when we reject the word of God, listen to me carefully. 
when we reject the word of God, we are rejecting God. And Jesus Christ, the word that was manifest in the flesh, Jesus would tell us in the book of John chapter 17, chapter 17 and the fourth verse, that they may know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ, the word whom thou have sent. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters, when you reject the word of God, you are in essence saying that you are greater than God. And that is exactly what the man of sin says, that we are above God so we could change his word. When he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, because we are bigger than God, because we are above God and his word, we could say that we don't have to keep God's seventh day Sabbath, but we could now make Sunday holy in honor of the resurrection of Jesus again. And my question to you, and the question you should ask your pastor, your preacher, your bishop, your priest, where is that in the Bible? It is not there. We're talking about the word of God. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, that word, that word that created the universe out of nothingness is the word that came and lived among us so that we would be restored into the image of God. Because God made man in his own image and in his own likeness. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verses 26, 27, 28. But because of sin, disobedience to God's word, God told our first parents that of every tree in the garden thou may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. God's word but they went against God's word and we are suffering the consequences today of going against God's word I want you to think for a moment as the world is now being programmed and being called to make the disobedience of God an international institution it is not going to bring peace and harmony and unity. We are not called to worship the earth. We're called to worship the creator of the earth. We're not called to institute and to reverence a day because of Jesus' resurrection. We're called to represent him by the lives that we live, to demonstrate to the world that he has come, that, that he has restored his image in us. That's how we reflect to the world and that's how we celebrate his resurrection. Jesus would declare, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. My dear brothers and sisters, the word of God, the word of God is truth. The psalmist David uh, would tell us in the Psalms, the 119th division, the 142nd verse, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is truth. God's word is his truth. God's word is his law. My dear brothers and sisters, this is a serious message for the times in which we live. Because every member of the human family has a choice to make today. They always do. Elijah told them, if God be God, worship him. And if Baal, then worship him. But more, but now, in these closing scenes of earth's history, more than ever before, each of us have to make a decision. And that decision is, are we going to honor the word of God? Or are we going to honor the traditions of men? Or are we going to put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Or are we going to put on the fig leaves as Adam and Eve tried to do when they sinned? God said that it's not enough. You need to understand 
the power of my word and obey the power of my word. My word which is truth. My word which is my law of David uh, continues. Thou art near, O Lord, and thy commandments are truth. Thy commandments are truth. His law is truth. His commandments is truth. His word is truth. He continues, my tongue shall speak of thy word, for thy commandments are righteousness. The word of God is righteousness. And of this morning, I want you to know that there is power, that there is power in the word of God. David, I just love the life of David. I see so much of myself in David. A heart that was purposed towards serving God, but so often that sinful man comes up. But David was always careful to go back to God because he knew that if he would but confess his sins, that the Lord would be faithful and just to forgive him and to cleanse him from all unrighteousness. And so David kept coming back to God and God inspired his mind and his thoughts to write so much about this God, to write so much about the power of the word of God. And so David tells us in Psalms 19, the law, of, God, of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. That's what the word of God does. It takes you from foolishness to wisdom. It takes you from wickedness to righteousness. David continues, the statutes of the Lord are right. The statutes or the word or the law of the commandments of God are right. Rejoicing the heart, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The great, uh, famous slave trader, the John Newton, when he come to realize the power of God's word and accepted Jesus Christ, the word as his personal savior. His life was changed from someone who was engaged in the most ignominious of human endeavor, the African slave trade, and he sat down and he wrote that hymn, that immortal hymn, Amazing Grace. I once was blind, but now I see. Why could he see? He could see because he understood the power of, of the word and he incorporated into his life and he became a preacher. And as a result of John Newton, millions would be saved in God's kingdom. We're talking about this morning the power of the word of God. The power of the word of God, it heals and restores. The scriptures from Genesis to Revelation testify to the fact that the word of God saves and, and sanctifies. It testifies to the fact that the word of God restores. Jesus, the living word, he had just preached what I consider, and many others, the greatest sermon that was ever preached in the annals of human history, the Sermon on the Mount, beginning in the book of John, chapter 5. And as he finished up preaching and was beginning to make his way through the crowd, he encountered a man who was afflicted with the most despicable disease of his time, the disease of leprosy. Leprosy caused you to be separated from your family, friends, and society. He became an untouchable because with a person with leprosy, when you encounter others, you have to say leprosy, leprosy, so they would know that you were a leper and they would walk away from you. 
Oh, but I want you to know this morning that the word of God touches the untouchable. That the word of God is love to the unlovable. And so the scriptures continued. It tells us in the book of Matthew, the eighth chapter, and behold, there was a leper who came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. The leper realized the power of the word. The power the leper had faith in the power of the word. It's unfortunate today that so many that call themselves Christians have little or no faith in the power of the word of God. If we do, society would not be in the way it is. The blame for so much that is happening in society rests on the shoulders of millions who call themselves Christians but continue to live in sin, continue to display envy, continue to, 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 to gossip, continue to try to oppress others, but nevertheless claim to be the children of the Most High King. And then others look around and say, why do I want to be part of that? I could just continue to live the way I'm living and I'll be okay. And verily that's what they preach, just keep on sinning and singing and swinging and you know, you'll make it into heaven anyway don't know the power of the word of God. That's all it's saying. But this leper, he knew the power of the word of God. And he says, if thou wilt be make me clean, uh, if thou wilt make me clean. Amen. And the Bible says, the word of God says, that the word in the flesh put forth his hand and touched him saying, I will be thou me clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. I want you to know that that power is still in the word. It is our faith that where the problem lies. It is not in the power of the word. And God is giving us time to develop and to strengthen that faith. Like as the leper, we would have faith in God that he know that he would bring forth the things that he wants to bring forth in our lives, which is the transformation of our characters to become more like Jesus. That power is in the word, not in the philosophies of men. The Bible continues, verse 5, the 8th chapter of the book of Matthew. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, he now crossed the river on the other side, there came unto him a centurion. A centurion was a Roman soldier that was in charge of at least a hundred men, the word centurion, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy and grievously tormented. In other words, I have a servant at home, Lord, is very sick. We tried everything. All the remedies we can't, we can't seem to make him well. And he says to Jesus, come and heal him. The Bible continues, the stensurian then said to Jesus, he said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should even come into my household and under my roof, but just speak the word. Just speak the word and my servant shall be healed. The centurion, the Roman centurion understood the power of God's word. And the Bible continues, the centurion says, Lord, I'm a man of authority. I have authority over men. And I say to this one, go, and he goeth unto the other, come. And he cometh. And to my servant do this, and he doeth it. And Jesus said unto him, the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, 
so be it done unto thee. And the servant was healed. In that very same moment, the power of the word, the centurion realized that Jesus doesn't even have to come and touch his servant. Oh yes, the power could heal by, by touch, the power of God's word, it could heal by touch, or it could heal by just us speaking the word. My brothers and sisters, the Apostle Paul reminds us about the power of God's word, what we're talking about. Uh, this morning he writes in the book of, of Hebrews, the first chapter, reflecting back on what Moses had said and also I'm sure of what John wrote. He said, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto his servants by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he had appointed years of all things by whom he had created the world. It was Jesus Christ, the word of God. Of course, he wasn't called Jesus Christ then, but he is now, he was then, and he forever will be for the word of God. And I want you to know that there is power in the word of God. Jesus would declare, I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man, no woman cometh unto the Father but by me. And Paul continues, who being in the brightness of his glory, the glory of his Father, an express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word, of his power. In other words, the stars in the galaxies, the millions of stars in the galaxies, the billions of galaxies, they are all upheld by the word of God. That's what the Bible says. I don't want to get that smart where I could deny what God says. The evidence is too much. In my own personal life and in the life of others, in the life of the things that we've seen happening in the world today, if we would study the word of God, we would see that God from the beginning foresaw and prophesied of them happening and they're happening precisely as he said they was. Why? because there is power there is power in the word of God Amen. Paul continues who being the brightness of his glory the express image of his father and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of his majesty on high Amen. the word of God I want you to know this morning, my dear brothers and sisters, there is no such thing as worshiping God outside of accepting his word and coming to realize the power of his word. There is no devotion of Christ without a devotion to his word. To reject the word is to be committing suicide. My dear brothers and sisters, Solomon says, fear God and keep his commandments for it is the whole duty of, of, of man. Fear God and follow his word. There is power in the word and that's what we all need. That's what the world needs to see Amen. is the power of God's word in the lives of those that call his name. Paul would write unto his, his protege, the young minister Timothy, might have been probably just a teenager at the time when Paul conscripted him as it were, as it were, to be his assistant. And Paul writes in the book of 2 Timothy in chapter 3 beginning at verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, thou hast known the word which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. 
Paul says, Timothy, I could look at you. I know your grandmother, Lois. I know the environment in which you were brought up, and you were brought up in an environment that recognized the power of the word. And then Paul says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, the power of the word of God. And again, let me reiterate, thanks God for allowing man the knowledge to put it on ink on paper, but where he wants it ultimately is in our heart. Isn't that what Jeremiah wrote about? That he will make a new covenant. And Paul tells us that that new covenant is writing of the word of God, the commandments of God in our hearts and men get up and claim to be the preachers of Jesus Christ and say we are under the new covenant so we don't have to keep the word of God. May God have mercy on their souls because the Bible is explicit that we must have the word in our hearts. My dear brothers and sisters, Paul continues that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That only comes from the power of the word. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, when we choose to do anything else outside of what God's word says, when we doubt the power of the word of God and try to do things on our own, the Bible calls it works. And our works are meaningless. When God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, the Sabbath day is the seventh day of the week. And yes, I'm going to keep on preaching about it because as we come to the closing scenes of our history, the word of God says that that is going to be the issue. It's being developed among us. The world is being prepared, celebrated Earth Week, Earth Day this week. And the solution that is proposed for Earth Day is to honor Sunday, to rest on Sunday. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, you would have to make a decision. Are you going to believe in the word of God? which says the seventh day is sanctified or set aside, or are you going to believe the word of the man of sin in association with the nations of the world? Who says, let's keep Sunday to save the earth? God says, keep Sabbath to save your soul. The man of sin says, keep Sunday to save the earth. Who are you going to believe? Decisions, you have to make a decision. Again, my... Favorite writer, Ellen G. White, the 19th, early 20th century Bible commentator. She writes about the word of God. She says, the creative energy that called the worlds into existence is the word of God. She says, this word begats life. Every command is a promise accepted by all, received into the soul. She says it is life, and with this life is the, uh, the life of the infinite one. It transforms the nature, and it creates in man the image of God, the word of God. David declares that the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show it forth his handiwork. We're talking about the power of God this morning. We see the power of God creates. The power of God heals. The power of God's word restores. The power of God's word transforms the character. The power of God's word lead us to be obedient to his laws and his commandments that's why we're here every Sabbath, because he says, remember his Sabbath. The very one that he said, remember, the whole world has forgotten. May God help you this morning to 
bring your life in accordance with God's word. The Jesus is the word made flesh. The Jesus is the word for body and soul. The Jesus, the Bible tells us, in the book of John, the sixth chapter, he had just finished feeding the 5,000 with two barley loaves and two fish. And, and he finished and he, his disciples departed before him, but he miraculously got onto the other side of the shore. You could read it in the book of John, chapter 6. And Jesus, when he got on the other side, the people were so satisfied. They were so blessed. They were so amazed by what he did that they followed him. And then Jesus continued to preach. And in John 6 and 51, Jesus says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And the people now begin to wonder, what is Jesus talking about? What they didn't realize, he was foretelling them what was to not too distant take place, that he would give his life on Calvary's cross for their salvation, for my salvation. The people were amazed and puzzled and he read their hearts and he continued, he says, Verily I say unto you that except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And now they're really amazed and puzzled and mesmerized. What is this man saying? Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, he hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day and there. Puzzled now. Oh, to the Jewish people, to drink blood is a, an abomination. And here is this humble carpenter, this itinerant preacher is telling us that we must drink his blood and, and eat his flesh. Oh, to eat flesh was unthinkable. My dear brothers and sisters, flesh that was not purified of the blood. To eat human flesh is cannibalism. And so they're becoming more mesmerized and puzzled. I really don't understand what this man is saying. I want you to know that the man of sin teaches that every day of the week, millions of times around the world, that men could take a glass of alcoholic wine and a piece of bread called a wafer and pray over it, say some mumbo jumbo, and it becomes the literal body of Christ and the blood of Christ. My dear brothers and sisters, that's not what Jesus was talking about. For the Bible records that Jesus, recognizing the astonishment of their hearts, Jesus declared, It is the spirit that quickeneth, John 6 and 63. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and earth and life. Jesus was talking about the power, the power of the word that giveth life. He didn't talking about literally eating his flesh and, and drinking his blood. Don't believe that. It is not of God. The multitudes, by this time, they had walked away from Jesus because they said that this is a crazy man. What is he talking about? Drinking blood and cannibalism? Oh no, we're not going to do that. Oh yes. He just fed us with, he just fed 5,000 plus with two loaves and uh, five loaves and two fishes. But this thing about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, we can't handle that. So the Bible says that they walked away, but I want to thank God 
for the faithful ones like Peter. And Peter says, the apostles ask, when Jesus says, will you also leave me? Would you follow them and go away? The disciples ask, well, where would we go? And they continued, Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou has the words. Thou has the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. We believe that you are not only the word spoken, but you are the living word. Jesus would tell us as he came to the close of his ministry, towards the close of his ministry, and he gathered his disciples together, and he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bringeth forth not fruit is taken away, and every branch that bringeth beareth fruit, I purge it, that it may bring forth fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. How do we abide in Christ? We eat his word. We study his word. That's how we abide in him. If you abide in me and my words, and my words abide in you, you shall ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. But men have become wise. They now has cast aside the word of God. And they now have gone into the seminaries and come out with intellectual philosophy. And as a result of what they call higher criticism, they now deny the word of God. And they're wondering and doing surveys as to why the people are leaving the church. Well, they're leaving the church because the church is not a place for your intellectual philosophy. The church is not a place for your political activism. The church is not a place, and Jesus is not a slot machine where you put in one dollar and you come out with 10,000. The church is to lift up Jesus Christ. He declared to the disciples, and I, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. You wonder why the churches are failing, why the young people, the old people are leaving the church? It's because the Christ of the church is not in the church. Bring him back and the church would grow. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, the word of God raises the dead. The word of God creates. The word of God heals. The word of God transforms, and the word of God raises the dead. Jesus, in the book of John chapter 11, you know, Jesus was so tormented in his works on planet Earth. But he had a family that he could have gone by and just kicked back as it were. The family of Mary, Martha, and Joseph, and, and Lazarus. And he could just go and relax because he know he'll have some peace when he comes to their house. Could Jesus find peace in your house? But one day when he was out preaching and word came to him that his friend, his good friend, his buddy, if you will, where they would kick back and hang out. Yes, that's what he did. He was a human. That's what he did. And he heard his friend Lazarus was dead. And at the short of the story, he waited about four days until after Jesus was, after Lazarus was dead. And then he came into the town of Bethany where they lived. And Lazarus' sister Martha reached Jesus and fell at his feet and says, Lord, we know that if you were here, my brother would have lived. But in the resurrection, we know you will raise him up. And Jesus says that, the resurrection is not future. It is now I am the resurrection and the life. And then he asked them where they had buried his friend Lazarus. And they told him, he says, go and move away the stone. And Jesus began to pray. He says, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I 
Know that thou hearest me always because of this people which stand by. I said it that they may believe that thou hast sent me. That's why he said, I am the resurrection. And now he's going to demonstrate it. Amen. And when he had finished praying, he shouted, Lazarus, come forth. One preacher said that he had to call the name of Lazarus because if he didn't, all the dead around him would have come forth. I don't know how true that is, but here it sounds uh, uh, quite plausible. Now, remember now, he didn't say, Lazarus, come down. And if I was Lazarus, and I'm in the beauty and the glory of heaven, the Jesus or no one else could get me to come down. So he didn't say Lazarus come down because Lazarus was not up there. Your dead, your dearly beloved, your mom, your dad, your sister, they're not up there. They're in the grave waiting on the resurrection. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, we can trust the word of God. It has power. We can depend on the word. Job know it well. He said, neither have I gone back from thy commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the word of his mouth more than necessary food. Not just any food. Necessary food is the food that you need to just barely survive. Think of the refugees and the homeless or what have you. Their necessary food may be food out of the garbage. Their necessary food may be just a bowl of, of sap. And Job is saying, I honor your word more than necessary food. Remember who is talking. A man who has lost everything that he ever had, his family, his, his riches. All he has is his breath, his bones, and his skin, his skin filled with sores. His wife rejected him. And he says, Lord, if I have a choice now between food and your word, I want your word. And we know because of God, of Job's faithfulness, he was restored to the fullness. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, David declared that thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. There are so many organizations that they says we are God's people because we go by his name, one of his names. But the Bible says, that he has magnified his word above his name. You may claim and name your organization after one of his names. But do you understand the power of the word to change lives? Are you following the word that says, remember his Sabbath day to keep it holy? This morning, brothers and sisters, the question is that, do you believe his word? Do you trust his word? Do you believe that there is power in the word in the midst of the deception and chaos and the uncertainty of this life? We have a sure anchor. We have a sure foundation and that foundation is the word of God. Amen. Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians that we wrestle not against flesh and blood uh, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Amen. And what is the remedy? He says the word of God. If you read that passage of scripture, it is all talking about the word of God. Ephesians, the sixth chapter, let's go there real quickly as we wrap up. He says, therefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Truth is the word of God. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, thy word is righteousness. And your feet shut with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace is the word of Jesus Christ. Above all, take on the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. How do we get faith? Faith cometh by hearing, and by hearing the word of God. So Paul is telling the people what they need is the word of God. And then he says, take on the helmet of salvation, which is the sword of the spirit. 
and the word of God, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the sword. Oh yes, my dear brothers and sisters, Jesus is coming soon. The word says, and I believe it, Paul tells us, he says, for this I say unto you by the word, <laughs> by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not perish, shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the year. And so shall we be with him forever. Do you believe the word? Do you trust the word? Whatever your circumstances this morning, whatever you're going through, whatever the chaos, the uncertainty, I give you this morning, my dear brothers and sisters, I encourage you <coughs> to take the word of God from the pages of the book, from your iPhone or your iPad or whatever pad, and put it in your heart. And you will see the power of the word. I'm a, a living, walking testimony of the power of the word of God. I'm not sharing theology with you. I'm sharing with you the reality of life. For it was for more than 12 or 15 years almost that I was on the wrong side of a crack cocaine pipe and someone introduced me to the word and I picked up the word. And the rest is history. I know what I'm talking about. There is power in the word of God. And God wants you to come to understand. David says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He wants you and I to have a similar conviction. And this morning, in whatever you may be going through, sickness, coronavirus, loss of job, loss of family. Whatever you're going through, I want to know that the word says, behold, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man may hear my voice, if any man, any woman may hear my word and open the door, open the door of your heart and come in and let him in, he will come in and sup with you and you with him. The question is, will you? I pray that you will. There may be someone that is listening this morning that has heard about Jesus, that have maybe even been studying the word and reading the word, but you have never given your life to Jesus Christ. There's a big difference. The theologians and the wise men of the world, they read the scriptures but it has not a transforming power in their lives. Jesus says, I want to come in. I want you to open your heart and let the word come in to your heart and to transform your life. Is there such a one this morning, wherever you are? I pray that in the quiet recesses of your heart that you would say, Lord, I'm opening up the door. I want you to come in. I can't handle the problems of my life. Oh yes, he's waiting. Earnestly and tenderly, Jesus is waiting to come home into your heart. What are you suffering with? Are you convicted that you gossip too much? That you lie too much? Are you convicted that you need to stop smoking, need to stop drinking, need to Stop lying. I want you to know that there is power in the word. Give it to Jesus. My dear brothers and sisters, as we close this morning, I simply say to us that there is power, that there is power in the word of God. Amen. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word and the power that is in your word, the power that creates, your word that creates, your word that transforms, your word that heals, 
your word that restores, your, your word that raises the dead from the grave, the word that upholds the, the galaxies and the moons and the stars, the word, dear Father, that will last us throughout the, the ceaseless ages of eternity. I pray that someone this morning, someone this morning, as they hear your word, even through this worthless piece of clay, that they would accept it. And as you have promised and as you have demonstrated, that it would bring peace and comfort, that it would bring solace to their lives, that it would transform their lives, that they may go out and to tell someone that their lives may be a testimony of the power of your word is my prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen, amen. and amen.